Hi, everyone. My name is Miriam Bravo, and I'm a PhD candidate at the International Laboratory for Human Genome Research. And I will present a paragenomic landscape of pathogen in pre and contact individuals from the Americas. Before I'll start, I would like to thank to the Organizing Committee of Holistic Bioinformatic Approaches used in Macrobiome Research for giving me the opportunity to talk about my research research and for putting this together. And also I would like to thank to my supervisor and my lab mate. The outline of my talk is ancient pathogen screening to a metagenomic analysis. And I will explain more about the taxonomic classification I used. Um, and we employed a software called Kraken. And I will also explain more about the the authenticity of ancient pathogen. And also, I will explain more about the evolutionary insights of the pathogen that we identify in archaeological remains. Also, about the phylogenetic relationships among modern and ancient pathogen using a maximum likelihood method. And as a last point, I will explain more about the gene presence absence analysis of ancient pathogen genomes that we reconstructed. And I will also explain about the research products and how apply these topics in two case studies without skipping the challenges I faced. And I additionally, I recommend you some, some useful tips for your research. To start with some background, ancient DNA is a multidisciplinary field since involves the interaction with bioinformatics, genetics, paleontology, and archaeology. By definition, the ancient DNA is the genetic material recovered from non-human and human archaeological remains. I refer to non-human remains as extinct animal tissues, like uh, mammals, and ice core, eggshells, sediments from the burials, and ancient plants like mice. And as for the human remains, I refer to bones and teeth, dental calculus, hair, and in some cases, a cropolite have allowed the recovery of ancient DNA. The DNA recovered from these archaeological remains is mainly fragmented, typically less than 100 base pair. Another important characteristic is the damage present in ancient DNA, which is originated from cytosine damination, commonly occurred at the ends of DNA molecules. Cytosine damination turns cytosines into uracils that are then misread as thymines by the DNA polymerase used during DNA library preparation. This leads to erroneous C to T substitution in the sequence data. In addition, the DNA recovered from archaeological remains is co-extracted with DNA from exogenous sources like DNA from microorganisms and from the people that handled the remains after the excavation. Having said that, working with ancient DNA can be very problematic, at the same time can be a valuable source of information. Since it's possible to retrieve the DNA from pathogens that infected human, humans during their lifetime. The teeth are the preferred source for ancient pathogen DNA recovery. Here I show you an image of an ancient incisor tooth and its cross-section view. The main components of the tooth anatomy are indicated. The pulp cavity is a conjunctive soft tissue, which is well protected from the outside and is characterized to have an abundant vascular system and nerves. Therefore, microorganisms could penetrate and circulate in blood vessels and colonize the dental pulp. Pathogens have been part of our evolution and have had long-term consequences on our genome. Here I show you an image depicting some of the deadliest pathogens in human, in human history, like Yersinia pestis, which had a great impact on human population, causing bottlenecks, 
which are referred to a reduction of the population size and therefore their genetic variation. This led us to pose the following research question, which were the causative agents of infection diseases in ancient individuals from the Americas. But first, I'll describe three phases of my data analysis project, which involves the exploratory, the refinement, and the polishing phase. Most of the time, we cycle through each phase multiple times. So I will start with the exploratory phase. So when I started my PhD, I faced one of my biggest fears, bioinformatics. Uh, my advisor asked me if I had any idea how to analyze the data that I already have generated in, in the lab. So at that time, the answer was no. So I have had taken a few introductory courses about Linux during my master's, but I was never interested enough to go deeper in any skill about bioinformatics. So I had no choice other than looking for more courses and ask to my lab mates. So here is some useful links where you will find nice introductory lessons about Unix, metagenomics, or even other types of online courses. And at some point, uh, you would like to share your knowledge with students from other parts of the world, like in Mexico. Clubes de Ciencia might be a good chance. So you will you could visit these links in, in the future. Another challenge that I faced was the ability to interact with archaeologists or anthropologists with no background on ancient DNA analysis. This was so important because it can represent an opportunity to enrich your research or even pose new questions. Also, during the exploratory phase of my research, I learned about the requirements needed to analyze ancient DNA. One of the most important ones is to assign a laboratory exclusive for its analysis. Here is a picture of our human palgenomic lab, which is physically isolated from the DNA modern lab. This is to avoid introducing any source of modern contamination during the processing of the ancient samples. If we take a look inside our palgenomics lab, we have three areas assigned to a specific task. We have a dressing room indicated by the number one, in which we have to wear a full Tyvek suit, gloves, shoe covers, hair coverings inside the lab. In the second area, we sample and process the archaeological remains. Like I show you in this image where I'm some sampling an ancient bone. The third area, in the third area, we extract the DNA and build the libraries for next generation sequencing. So moving on to the refinement phase of my research, we established a preliminary pipeline in which we analyzed 96 individuals from Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. We generated shotgun sequencing data, and then through metagenomic analysis, we identify pathogen in archaeological remains. In the following slide, I'll explain in much more detail every step. As for the wet lab strategy, we extract the DNA mainly from teeth and bones. We first decontaminate the outer surface of this substrate, and then we take a small portion of the bone, or in this case, of the root of the teeth. Then we extract the DNA and we quantify the DNA concentration that we recovered. After this step, we build sequencing libraries, in particular double-stranded, and then we amplified and indexed those libraries to obtain shotgun sequencing data. 
as the DNA extract contains a large fraction of environmental, bacterial, fungal, and other sources of DNA, we can specifically target the pathogen of interest DNA by using capture enrichment enrichment method that make use of biotinally RNA baits that hybridize to the region of interest and then recover these hybrids using a stratabidine coated magnetic bits washing away of target molecules. We have to evaluate the quality of the DNA in the steps I point out with a blue circle, which I call a decision point. As for the bioinformatics strategy, we decided to follow the strategy designed prevalently by my advisor during her postdoc. We first start with FASTQ files generated from the shotgun sequence data. Then we pre-process these files, removing the adapters using the software adapter removal. Then we map against the human genome. We evaluate the quality of risk using FASTQC software. At this point, we, des we decide if the sample has the quality enough to carry out the following analysis. And also this is referred to a decision point. Then we select the map read to the human genome. The reads that we don't know what exactly is there and perform a metagenomic analysis. We use a database downloaded from the NCBI RefSec including bacterial, archaea, and viral genomes. I didn't curate the database because I wasn't sure about which criteria I should have followed. I tried two software specific for ancient DNA data called Falcon and Mount, and I didn't have success. So this was a dead end. In the case of Mount, the computational resources we had at that time were not enough to build the database necessary for this software. In this link, you will find some useful information about which taxonomic class classifier you should use. And also, I tried with another software. One is called Diamond, which aligns DNA reads or protein sequences against a protein reference database. Also, I use Metaflan, which employs a clade specific marker sequences to estimate microbial abundance. Another tool that I use is Kraken, a taxonomic classifier which matches each KMER within a query sequence to the lowest common ancestor. So after obtaining the taxonomic classification by Kraken, we obtained a file called Kraken Biome, which is a biological observation matrix. And this format will allow us to visualize the microbial abundance obtained from archaeological remains. We follow two strategies. One based on graphical user interface programs like Pavian and Metacomet and the other strategy, which does not involve a graphical user interface like R. And then we screen the presence of pathogen and we do this manually. We inspect the main species found in the sample and we search according to modern sources of information. So after identifying the presence of pathogen DNA in the archaeological samples, we evaluate its authenticity. As I mentioned previously, we evaluate the base substitution C2T and J2A, which are characteristic of ancient DNA. We used a program called Map Damage, which help us to visualize the frequency of this substitution and is represented by this type of graph. And the graph in the bottom, it is 
an example of how should look a modern sample, which is the lack of this base substitution. Then after evaluating the authenticity of the ancient DNA, we, we decide to follow a capture enrichment step, as I mentioned previously, and then we decide if we have the data enough to carry out phylogenetic reconstruction. We normally do this type of analysis using genes and the other strategy involves the single nucleotide polymorphism with modern and ancient genomes. And an additional analysis we normally do is to evaluate the presence and the absence of certain genes that are involved in pathogenicity and virulence mechanisms. In this phylogenetic reconstruction, we are interested to understand the relationship among modern and ancient genomes. And as you can see in this image, where the species of group of interest are found at the tips of the lines referred to as the tree branches. In this image, the phylogenetic tree represents relationship among five species, A, B, C, D, and E, which are positioned at the ends of the branches. The pattern in which the branches connect represents our understanding of how the species in the tree evolve from a series of common ancestors. At each point lies the most common reason ancestor of all the groups descended from the branch point. For instance, at the branch point giving rise to the species A and B, we will find the most recent common ancestor of those two species. At the branch point right above the root of the tree, we will find the most recent common ancestor of all the species in the tree, A, B, C, D, E. Each horizontal line in our tree represents a series of ancestors leading up to species at its ends. For instance, the line leading up to species E represents the species ancestors since it diverged from the other species in the tree. Similarly, the root represents a series of ancestors leading up to the most recent common ancestor of all the species in the tree. We're planning to improve the previous strategy that I explained before, and we are planning to apply a pipeline specific for ancient DNA, like this is like shown in this image. So I'm moving on to the third phase, which is called the polishing phase. And this phase, I'll explain more about two research products. In this phase, we analyze 20 pre-contact individuals from Mexico and, 30, and 33 individuals from contact period also from Mexico. And as for South America, we analyzed 21 pre-contact individuals and 22 contact individuals from Argentina and Brazil. As the first research product, which is called Recovery of an Ancient Salmonella Enterica Genome from a Colonial Individual from Mexico City. And we have done this study in collaboration with two researchers from Mexico and from Copenhagen, Denmark. To start with some background, Salmon Lenterica is a rod shaped gram negative facultative intracellular pathogen which causes a severe bacteremic illness referred to tiforai and paratiforai fever and collectively called as enteric fever. This is caused by salmonella occurs after ingestion of food or beverage contaminated with the bacterium, which is depicted in this figure. After gaining access to the gut lumen, the bacteria disseminates systemically via the lymphatic system and the symptoms can vary from 
asymptomatics to severe, to severe ones, causing perforation and profuse hemorrhage of ileal ulcers. Today, three studies have recovered the genome of these bacteria from teeth samples. The oldest genome reconstructed so far is from an individual recovered from Norway. The second one involved the analysis of samples from Russia, Italy, and Turkey. And the most recent one is from two individuals recovered from South Mexico. The identification of ancient DNA of paratyphy C genome from, from boreals linked to the Cocoliskli epidemic outbreak occurred during 1545 and 5050, located in Teposcolula, Yocunda, Mexico, suggested to be one of the possible causes of Cocoliskli at this part of Mexico. Cocoliskli is a daily disease of a known cause, which was characterized to cause an intense bleeding and high fever. It was estimated that between 5 to 15 millions of individuals die because of this epidemic outbreak. To gain insight into human pathogen in the post-contact period, we screen teeth from colonial period, individuals from Mexico City. The colonial individuals are from the Temple of the Immaculate Conception, located in Mexico City. We analyzed seven teeth samples, and we follow the strategy that I explained before. And as you can see in this slide, in one colonial individual, we identify numerous reads assigned to Salmonella enterica paratyphy C, which causes paratyphoid fever in humans. We observed the characteristic damage patterns expected for ancient DNA and reads mapped to the paratyphy C reference genome. We decided to capture the genome of paratyphy C and complement with the shotgun data previously generated and deep sequencing data. The pre-capture library had a 5.3 fold enrichment post capture. This allows us to assess its phylogenetic relationship with available genomic sequences of ancient and modern strains of Salmonella paratyphy C. For the phylogenetic placement, we include six ancient Salmonella enterica genomes indicated in this map, two from Mexico and three individuals from Europe. In the alignment, we also include 18 Salmonella enterica modern genomes. We select the genomes with depth above 3x to ensure reliable SNP coding. The phylogenetic analysis was performed with approximately 70,000 SNPs that could be called from at least 90% of the genome. All Salmonella enterica genomes from ancient individuals are phylogenetically close to the previously designated paracy lineage. The ancient genome recovered in this study called C O05 and together with the previously reported genomes for South Mexico, Tepos 14 and Tepos 35, clustered with modern paratyphy C. In summary, we were able to reconstruct a paratyphy C genome approximately with a 10x depth from Mexico City dated to colonial period. This study provides a direct evidence that paratyphy C affected people elsewhere besides only the south of Mexico. During the 1545 Cocoliskli epidemic outbreak. Through fall genetic analysis, we were able to determine a close relationship between our strain and two strains from recover from South Mexico. We are interested in identifying generic variants in these ancient genomes related to the evolution and pathogenicity of Samuel and paratyphy C in Mexico population during the colonial period. And the second research 
project that I would like to share with you is Palgenemic Insights into the Red Complex Bacteria, Tanerella forsythia, in the Americas through Palgenomics. We analyzed 53 individuals from central Mexico, and also we included previously reported data from four individuals from Europe. As for the pre-contact individuals, we analyzed 19 individuals, and as for the colonial ones, we analyzed 32 individuals. After analyzing the metagenomic profile of the pre and contact individuals from Mexico, we were able to identify the presence of the red complex bacteria, which is formed by Tanella forsythia, Porphyromonas gingivalis, and Treponema denticula. And these bacteria are point, pointed out in this figure by the red color. We found these bacteria in seven pre-contact individuals and in five colonial individuals. Two out of the seven pre-Hispanic TID positive for Tanella forsythia individuals were associated to a high Rankin status. This could be involved a different lifestyle and a different diet compared to the other individuals and this could be influence the presence of certain bacteria in this case like Tanella forsythia. We decided we decided to capture 234 genes involved in essential process and also involved in antibiotic resistant mechanism. And additionally genes involved in transported and violence mechanism. After the capture enrichment strategy, we were able to reconstruct the phylogenetic relationship of 15 ancient and two modern Tanella forsythia genomes. And as you can see in this image, the pre-contact individuals indicated by light green form a cluster. On the other hand, we see a second cluster formed by colonial individuals indicated by a blue line and also this cluster is conformed by European strains indicated by the red color. So as you can see, the phylogenetic placement in this genome follow temporal fashion. We were able to distinguish the pre-contact strains and the colonial individuals. And when we evaluate the presence and absence of the 234 capture genes, we observe a differential presence of two genes, annotated as having essential functions between pre-Hispanic and colonial individuals and also European individuals. And we're expanding this project in collaboration with two researchers from the University of Lausanne. In this study, we're interested in reconstruct the Tanada for City genome from hunter gatherers from Brazil, and also trying to understand its relationship with the previously reported data from our previous study and also from an ancient individual from Chile and individuals from Europe. To better understand the genetic diversity of Tanella forsythia, we evaluate its phylogenetic placement to other ancient Tanella forsythia genomes from Chile, Mexico, and Europe, as well as modern strains. We built a phylogenetic tree only selecting the Tanella forsythia genomes above 4x depth of coverage. And as you can see, the phylogenetic positioning followed a temporal trend. The individual called MN119 grouped to a modern strain from the United States and to a historical individual from Germany. 
CS40. A second plate was composed of pre-Hispanic individual from Mexico and one individual from Chile. This indicates that the Tanella Forsythia strain found in MN119 individual was probably introduced during the European colonization of Brazil. Further genomic characterization of ancient Tanella Forsythia genomes across the Americas will contribute to the understanding of the pathogenicity mechanisms of this pathogen. The overall take home message of this talk is that through ancient DNA and bioinformatics strategies, we were able to identify two pathogen DNA, Tanella forsythia and Salmonella enterica paratyphi C, and to understand more about their evolution and genetics from pre-contact and colonial individual from Mexico and also from hunting gatherers from Brazil. Thank you for listening and I will be happy to answer the question through Slack or during the question and answer live session on Thursday.